I know it's early in the morning and I'll uh, try not to uh, get too detailed about things. And uh, I also uh, realize that maybe some of you are here expecting the billion devices talk and I'm looking forward to it as well. So, <laughs> uh, so authentication is something we do every day, uh, dozens of times, right? And what is authentication? Well, typically, uh, in computer science and cybersecurity, we talk about the notion of identity that in any system, uh, there are sort of uh, actors or subjects and objects in the system, and we have to assign an identity to each one of them, right? Uh, for and, and authentication then is essentially uh, this process of binding an identity to a subject. So subject claims an identity, I say I'm Memon, and then there is a protocol of some sort which uh, establishes the fact that I do indeed have this identity. I can, I can actually claim this identity. And you know we do it for accountability, access control, and, and things of that sort. Uh, one thing to note is that identity is often not a secret, right? Uh, my email address, for example, if that's used as a username, that's not a secret. Uh, the identity as we see in the physical world, when you look at me, you say, yep, that's Nasser, I saw him five years ago, but he kind of still looks the same, it is him, right? Uh, again, is, is not a secret. Right. Some identities are much harder to replicate than others. Uh, so you can easily type in my email address. So that's an identity that can be easily copied by anybody. But no matter what plastic surgeon I, I employ or hire, I probably won't unlikely be able to change me into looking like someone like her. Right? Uh, some identities are much harder to, to replicate. So that's, that's important to note when we're doing uh, authentication. And then the other fact is that there are two types of authentication. Uh, one is machine-to-machine -machine authentication, when your, maybe your uh, desktop is authenticating itself to Amazon or vice versa. Uh, and then there, there are math mathematical protocols known for this, right, based on strong secrets that we call. So there are protocols. Uh, of course, there are always implementi implementation issues and human behavior issues and things of that sort, but we know how to do this well. At least mathematically, we have good sound protocols for doing machine-to-machine -machine authentication. But the other kind of authentication is what we call human-to-machine authentication. When you're authenticating humans, there we have issues because of the fact that humans cannot sort of really remember a strong secret. So these are based typically on what we call weak secrets. Right? And over the time, over the years, over the dec uh, decades, uh, there are sort of three sort of standard textbook-like approaches that we talk about. Uh, one is based on what you know, a secret, like a password. Uh, something based on what you have, like your phone or a dongle that you're carrying. Or, and the third is something that you are, right? Your inherent sort of characteristic, like your face or a fingerprint and things of that sort. And among these, uh, passwords, the what you know kind of techniques, have been sort of really dominant, right? Uh, we have been trying for decades, uh, but still passwords is more or less uh, the dominant way that of, of authenticating uh, folks. Uh, things are evolving, multi-factor and things of things, uh, dual factor and things of that sort, but passwords remain some sort of part of it. And the problem with passwords is that, of course, that they are essentially uh, susceptible to what is called a dictionary attack, right? Because humans uh, pick uh, weak passwords and essentially if one gets hold of the password hash file because they're stored as in the form of hashes in, in, in the server, uh, one can have these pre-computed dictionaries uh, that allows them to crack the passwords. Right? And uh, they have been very sophisticated techniques. Again, not new, for known from decades, called rainbow tables that do space-time trade-offs. And it's kind of 
So the general word out is that do you have rainbow tables that can basically brute force any eight character password, right? No matter what you use, what kind of special characters and things like that. We can simply brute force that entire space, right? Uh, and so, so that's the issue with passwords, and there's been a lot of it, uh, sort of, a lot of attempts at replacing them, saying like uh, passwords have become the bane of modern existence, right? Uh, but nevertheless, they are hard to replace. Uh, they've been, they've been, uh, uh, we've been trying to replace them, and we perhaps are making progress in the direction, but we've found them to be hard to replace. Why? Well, there was a nice article done by uh, uh, Bono, Carmack, and uh, et cetera, uh, who looked at the different authentication techniques out there and looked at their desirable characteristics from three points of views, usability, security, and deployability. And they looked at, OK, what, what would one want from a replacement? What characteristics would one want? And they kind of came up with a few such categories, such that memory-wise effortless, uh, scalable, nothing to carry, physical, physically effortless, I don't have to physically exert myself to authenticate, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and uh, then they also looked at security-based sort of characteristics, that is, uh, they should be resilient to observation, uh, targeted imper uh, impersonation, guessing, guessing attacks like the dictionary attacks, and the two types of guessing attacks, throttled and unthrottled. Throttled is when you're online trying to guess somebody's password, and after three attempts, five attempts, ten attempts, whatever, it would either slow you down, give you a captcha, or even lock you out. They don't do that anymore. But nevertheless, uh, that's called throttling, right? They limit the number of guesses that you have. Uh, but the attackers also, what do they do? They then essentially don't go vertically into accounts, they go horizontally, right? So they basically say, okay, the password could be uh, Celine Dion, I saw her face on a poster there, and then they try all the accounts on Google and see if the password Celine Dion works, right? So going horizontally instead of uh, trying many passwords for one person. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there are these kind of security issues that, that they looked at. Uh, and they also looked at deployability issues, which is quite crucial. I mean, most of you being industry folks realize that you can't simply change things uh, that has been largely deployed already easily. Uh, and, and after looking at these characteristics, kind of it becomes clear that there is no very obvious candidate that we have to replace passwords, sort of in the sense that they give a nice trade-off between these characteristics. They seem to do uh, quite well. But nevertheless, we've been trying. In academia, we've been trying uh, for, for decades. All kinds of esoteric techniques have been developed. Uh, and industry has tried too, right? Uh, Android has the pattern lock. Uh, Microsoft and I think Windows 8 came up with that visual uh, password. Uh, and uh, I myself, uh, the, the middle thing, had, had tried something called pass points about uh, more than 10 years back, but nobody used it, right? And then people are even talking about brain waves and things of that sort. So all kinds of esoteric stuff is going on, but passwords kind of still reign. They're still uh, dominant. And, but I think there is, there is hope that we will soon perhaps replace passwords. Uh, and I believe it's for two reasons. Uh, one is because the interfaces are changing, right? Uh, the password was a natural way to authenticate yourself given the fact that your keyboard was your primary way of inputting into the computing device, right? With a keyboard, password makes sense. But now that you have different kinds of interfaces, touch interface, voice interface, motion interface, camera interfaces, etc., cetera, a password doesn't really match these very well. Uh, and we, we, we have started to look for alternatives on such interfaces. And, and the second is mobility. Um, 30 years back, when passwords were devised as a way of authenticating humans, uh, the general scenario, usage scenario, was you sit in your office or a cubicle or your room or something of that sort in more or less uh, isolation or some amount of privacy, and you entered the password. But today, with mobile devices, you're, you're, you're authenticating yourself everywhere all the time. Uh, and, and hence, uh, 
you are you are sort of uh, susceptible to what is called a shoulder surfing attack. Somebody looking over and actually sees your your password. I'd done a survey three or four years back, and about 70% of uh, the respondents said that they actually had observed somebody's uh, password or or pattern lock or whatever accidentally or whatever when uh, over over time right that and and if you have a little brother little sister or whatever you you can be you can bet that they they know your password they've seen you doing it right so so the, the so there is this issue of uh, shoulder surfing attack or whatever mobility that that becomes a problem uh, when you talk about passwords so and as I said, over the years, over the last 10, 15 years, there have been a lot of different techniques that have been proposed. And what I will try to just give you a brief overview of today is, is the kinds of things that have been done for what I call natural user interfaces, right? Like the touch interface, camera interface. So interfaces that allow us to kind of interact with the device in, in ways that, uh, that we are used to doing naturally in any case, right? By gesturing or, or talking or, and things of that sort. So, so if you look at sort of the five currently known or reasonably used uh, natural interfaces, the touch interface, which is very dominant, uh, camera interface, uh, motion sensors, uh, microphone, which is getting more and more used with Alexa and Google Assistant and things of that sort. Uh, and with in cars and mo, mo, and, and uh, brain computer interface so these if you have these interfaces and then you 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 interact them in, with with them in some way so there is an actuator in some sense right so uh, you could use your finger along with this interface you could use your hand uh, you could use your entire body you could use your head uh, you could use your uh, vocal cords or you could use your thoughts right your brain and there are three or four kinds of inputs that you could provide. Uh, you could provide a secret <clears throat> using that particular interface and a specific actuator. Uh, you could provide a secret. You could provide some kind of a behavioral biometric. You could provide a physiological biometric, or you could provide some combination of that. Right? So we came up with this just last month. We came up with this taxonomy. And then we started looking at, OK, what kinds of where where is it that we have known techniques and where are the gaps right and if if you sort of plot this out you see that there are lots of things that we really haven't tried still uh, and of course some of them don't make sense i won't interact with my finger and uh, with my brain i mean it doesn't make sense and i won't interact with a touch surface using my vocal cords that doesn't make sense so some of them don't make sense but there are still some out there which could potentially be looked at uh, and, and also the other thing to see is that a, a quite a lot number have already been dis tried as well, right? So there's, um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through and give you some examples of some of these techniques. But as I do that, the question then is how do you evaluate them, right? So when you look at a particular candidate authentication technique, how do you say that this is, uh, this is a viable one or if it makes sense? Uh, well, typically in the world of security, uh, in, in, for authentication, you eval one evaluation is uh, security, which is it should be able to withstand random guessing, shoulder surfing. Uh, by insider threat, I'm, I meant your little sister or your colleague in your office who, who gets the chance to observe you quite a lot, quite quite often, and is able to uh, see your password. And by surveillance threat, I mean the surveillance cameras, right? So today, when as you're walking on the street and entering your password, a surveillance camera can easily pick it up. Uh, people have shown that it's very easy to do that. Uh, so now, so does does that scheme, does it resist uh, sort of capturing by, by a surveillance camera? And in terms of usability, uh, we looked at sort of a few characteristics. One, one is false negatives. A lot of these authentication techniques, especially some that require behavior, uh, can have false negatives in the sense because if you're doing a, a, a even with your Apple, for example, when you're doing a fingerprint match, uh, sometimes it says, no, nope, do it again, right? That's a false negative. And if false negatives are high, that makes it sort of not very usable. You'll stop using it. So you want low false negatives. On the other hand, for security, you want low false positives. So you have to find that, that balance. Uh, you may want to find it hands-free. Right? You may want to authenticate while driving, for example, uh, without using your hands. Or if, so 
uh, there are certain situations, depending on the context, uh, that could be a, a very important usability criteria. You may authenticate, you may want to authenticate in an ice-free manner as well, not having to look at something in order to authenticate. Again, while performing some task, or in my case, when I'm attending a meeting uh, with, the, with the dean and other department heads, or things of that sort, uh, the meetings are quite boring and you want to check your email and you don't want to bring that thing up and do it in front of everybody so you could just under the table authenticate yourself without revealing the fact that you are uh, sort of looking at your phone. Uh, I'm just joking, but, but there are many situations in which ice-free uh, authentication could be, could be useful. Uh, same thing for efficiency, whether it's a pleasant interaction and universal, universality in the sense that everybody should be able to do that, right? So keeping these in mind, let's look at some examples. Uh, I, we can go on and on because there's so many techniques that have been uh, devised. Uh, so let's start with the touch interface, right? So if you think about it in the taxonomy that I gave, touch interface, then what actuator and what kind of input? So T star star, I call it. So if you look at the touch interface and if your finger is the actuator and if the input is a secret, then the Android pattern lock is sort of a technique that we all know, right? That would fall under that category of, of the taxonomy. And this is called recall-based sort of visual passwords, but uh, that's fine, we, we, and we know the problems with it. Uh, one is that it's not susceptible to shoulder surfing at all, right? Someone can easily tell, uh, even much easier than a password as to what your pattern is. And then people, again, just like passwords, they, weak, weak, they, they select weak patterns. So if you're presented with a grid and say, pick a pattern to, 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 as your secret, guess where everybody starts? Upper left corner, right? Everybody's pattern starts with the upper left corner. I, I tried uh, experiments where I made some other cells like blink and made them red color and made them different shapes, trying to attract people's attention to another dot starting point. It didn't work. Everybody starts at the upper left corner. The only thing that works, you simply delete that upper, upper left corner. You say, no, start from somewhere else. In that case, where do they start? Upper right corner. So, 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 it, it, uh, so it's not a very sort of uh, high entropy secret, uh, right? That's the problem with it. Uh, and then, of course, it's known that given a, given a device, one can look at the smudge patterns and then be able to figure out what, uh, what the pattern is, right? unlocking pattern is. Then somebody else started looking at, okay, if the pattern itself is an issue, why not we incorporate behavior as well, right? The way I unlock, uh, perhaps, uh, is in some sense distinct. Unique would be a very strong word, but there is some distinctive characteristics in the way I draw that pattern. So you can capture that. You can capture that by the pressure of the touch, the speed of the touch, and other sort of physical characteristics you can extract from the uh, feedback that you get from the touch interface. And people looked at that and currently, so, so that starts giving you some susceptibility against these things, but the problem is uh, it still has a lot of false, positive, uh, false negatives, right? right, right? So it, 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 it tends to, we, we're still not at a point where you're able to do this with good accuracy. Right? Uh, Another way we looked at was, okay, pattern is one thing, what about the pin, right? Instead of typing in the pin, which somebody can look at, why not we just draw it, right? And uh, I can, on the touch surface, I can simply draw the pin. And then again, my, the way I draw specific digits is kind of, again, distinct, right? And also, when I'm drawing it, the, the image of the thing need not show up on the screen. It can be ice free as well because I could be just looking at you and just drawing it uh, without looking at the touch surface, right? So it can be, there, there's certain usability characteristics uh, it has and one does get a higher amount of uh, uh, accuracy with it as compared to the Android unlock, right? Uh, and, and even if somebody knows your pin, uh, for, it's hard for them to draw it the way you do. And the good thing is the user doesn't have to learn another sort of framework, another way of authenticating. It's the same secret, but you're entering it in different ways, right? And I think this is one direction we could be going, whereby you don't have to have 
sort of different secrets for different devices in different contexts. Uh, it could be the same secret, same pin. You speak it, you write it, you type it. And there are different ways of entering it that you can have, uh, depending on the context. If you're in a bar and it's very loud, you don't have to speak it. Or if you're in a public place, you don't have to speak it. But if, you wake up, but if you're in a home, there's no need to type something. You can just speak it, because that might be the most easiest, natural thing to do. Right? So, uh, but in any case, so this is an example of a technique that same one secret can be entered in, in uh, two different ways. And we start getting about 4% uh, equal error rates here. Uh, and uh, if the attackers try, they, they're getting only about a 10% chance of success after learning your pattern and practicing and, and, and things of that sort. So again, more, more work needs to be done to, to make this sort of uh, have the accuracy that may be needed in a real life sort of deployment. Uh, another thing we looked at was uh, signatures, right? So again, on touch, uh, why draw a pattern? Signature is something that I know it's like embedded in my head or my fingers. I just give me a surface and I can just draw it, right? Uh, and my signature is not a secret. Uh, I, I, I do render it on many documents which I share with people. But the way I draw it is. Right? And, and this is called online signatures verification. So it's, it's, it's the flare, the speed, the pressure. Uh, it's very hard for someone to imitate and draw it exactly the way, the way I do. Uh, we had done this about six, seven years back. My, my uh, uh, students uh, made an iPhone app and put it out for sale for four bucks. Uh, and uh, we were selling like 10 copies a day or something of that sort. We reduced the price to 99 cents. We're selling maybe 20 copies a day. So we, we shut it down. And it never caught on, right? Uh, but, they, but it's an interesting approach, nevertheless, could, which could be uh, sort of uh, viable in, in some scenarios, depending on the device and, and the context. Uh, but one thing I've no there are some issues with it. One thing I quickly learned is that the millennials, they don't know what a signature is. I mean, they're not used to doing this stuff, the young people. Because you, you and me, we've signed a lot in our lives. But some, ask a 20-year-old and they say, signature? What the heck is that? Right? Uh, so that, that's one issue with it. And then the other issue is this notion of complexity, in the sense that if one has a very complex signature, then matching it every time and saying yes is because there's variation in it then uh, becomes a problem and if one has a very simple signature just like a circle or something then it can be copied very easily right so what is when you enter a password and the system says uh uh that's not not a strong password give me something better what do you do with signatures what what makes a reasonably good signature from a complexity simplicity trade off kind of thing from a false positive false negative trade off thing so we, we don't have good ideas about that. People have come up with quality metrics and, and things of that sort. So, but you get very good accuracy. Uh, you get about 3% EER, equal error rates, uh, which could be close to what might want in, in a reasonable deployment. Right? So that's single finger, finger with the touch surface. Right? Uh, but then, instead of if the touch surface is larger, like a coffee table or a wall display or, or even a, one of these big tablets, one can use all the five fingers, right? Uh, so one can actually do a gesture, like a, like a rotate gesture or a pinch gesture or, or a zoom gesture. And that gesture captures not only the phys physiology of my hand, right, because my hand geometry somehow influences those touch trails that are left on the touch surface. Uh, but also the, phys uh, the, the physiology in the sense of my, the, the way I do these things, the, the suppleness of my fingers and, and other characteristics, right? Uh, so this uh, we looked at, again, a few years back, and we showed that there's a reasonable amount of distinctiveness in, among these uh, touch gestures, that one can use a simple gesture or, or a sequence of gestures or even a custom-made gesture that someone can pick, right? Uh, in order to, uh, as, as their authenticating secret. So uh, authenticating input, right? Authenticating credential. Uh, and it, it, it could be partly a secret, uh, in the sense it may not be known widely. Or, and it also, it captures behavioral biometrics, right? The way you do the gestures uh, is uh, sort of distinct. And, and uh, again, we, we get reasonably good 
uh, accuracy, about 8% equal error rates. Uh, there were interesting work experiments we did where we sort of tried to figure out what gestures are more pleasing and less pleasing and things of that sort. Because there is a lot of, there is some connection between our human state, our, our state of mind and, and our body uh, sort of posture. And the, and the gestures we make. Some gestures make us feel better, and some gestures don't make us feel better. Uh, it's kind of surprising, but, but that's, that's uh, the case. And uh, the, the colleague I worked with specializes in this thing for games, for example. Uh, and uh, it turns out that some of the gestures that we actually enjoy doing are, are the ones that have higher entropy. Right? Another thing you could so so another thing you can do with gestures is uh, with touch surfaces uh, sort of somehow uh, use your body as the actuator to touch. It sounds a bit strange, but you can take a phone. I don't have one here with me, but pretend this is a phone. Press it against your ear, and the touch pattern that's formed on the surface somehow is again has some amount of distinctiveness to it. You can touch other parts of your body, whatever. You want to touch your nose or touch your face. And, and those touch patterns have some amount, researchers have shown that they have some amount of distinctiveness in it. And they could be potentially used. So it's kind of interesting whereby, for example, and I, maybe I'm rushing ahead of myself, you pick up the phone. And the motion sensors capture your, the way you pick it up and sort of characterize it as kind of typical of you. And when you touch it to the ear, it kind of captures that and say, yup, it looks like this is you. And be able to authenticate yourself automatically, right, seamlessly. Uh, so people have looked at uh, body prints and, and things of that sort as well. Uh, so and they seem to show that uh, you can get reasonable accuracy with these as well. And again, one can go into details about what kind of situations can you use them in and, 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 and things of that sort, the usability, security, and stuff like that. But uh, uh, those were some examples with the touch interface. Uh, with the camera interface, uh, we can, of course, now we have the face. Uh, face has been used for some time. Uh, the problem with face, of course, is the face is not a secret. right? Uh, your face is not a secret, uh, and it can be spoofed. Uh, and it can be also captured without your consent, right? You don't have to do anything in order to authenticate yourself. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, if you look at, uh, there, there was, uh, if, if you want, if, if the FBI wants to force someone to authenticate, they can just grab your phone, point it at you, and boom, they got it. Right? So you, you, you can't refuse to reveal your password to, to the law enforcement uh, because, of course, you can quickly shut your eye and things of that sort. Apple is looking for the fact that uh, your eyes might be, uh, need to be open uh, for it to authenticate. And also, if you looked at something like the San Bernardino case where they couldn't unlock uh, the phone, for example, uh, if face is the primary mechanism, then again, uh, one can use that to potentially unlock phones and, and things of that sort. So the, one of the problems with face is it's, it's not, uh, 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 the, it, it's a physiological biometric, and physiological biometrics are typically not, not secrets. Uh, of course, uh, and again, it depends on the device. Uh, uh, when we're talking about uh, a Fitbit or, 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 or a watch or something of that sort, then the face may not be the right mechanism to, to authenticate. Right. Uh, people have also talked about body gestures. Uh, so in front of a camera, so for example, with an Xbox or in one of these game, gaming boxes which have these cameras, instead of going tick, 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 and entering a letter and go tick, 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 entering a letter, which is so painful, uh, many of you may have done that, one can simply gesture in front of that, right? So people have shown that uh, even uh, two people with the same sort of body shape, uh, the way they perform a gesture uh, is, again, distinctive to some extent. And that allows you to, to potentially authenticate someone, right? With varying sort of uh, accuracy. Uh, how much time do I have? OK. So. We can also, if, if you're talking about authentication when you're, when you're wearing a, a headset with a, with a camera that equipped with a camera, one can 
use something like you can use the display and have some sort of a mapping going on. So if I, if I want to use, say, enter a pin, so for example, with the Google Glass, right? Uh, the way to authenticate on the Google Glass was by the tapping pattern that you had to do on the glass. Uh, there were four possible taps, and one could do a combination of them to unlock it. But if there is a camera display that is private, in the sense only you can see it, uh, then you can easily use a pin-like mechanism, for example, where if your password is uh, 1234, if your pin is 1234, that shows you a random dynamic mapping, and then you say 7526, and, and uh, that, that way you're now entering 1234, right? Uh, one can have that random mapping going on. And whoever's listening to you don't know what that mapping is, and that mapping changes every time, so you're able to authenticate yourself. One can also use hand gestures with the camera and things like that uh, people have looked at. So, so with cameras, it's face, gestures, and perhaps utilizing a, 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 a private display, those three kinds of techniques that are out there that, that people have proposed and, and are using. Uh, then, of course, you have motion sensors, so techniques that, are, that exploit a motion sensor. So you had the leap motion sensor, sensor for example, which was like a USB, sorry, uh, a USB-like device or, or connected to your computer and you simply wave your hand and it had these light emitting diodes and these uh, which sort of emits and then capture backs, the reflections back and is able to capture the, the, not just the geometry of your hand but what your hand is doing, right? Gesturing this way up or down and then without touching anything one can gesture in the air and control an interface. So the same, so people have looked at using leap uh, interfaces with uh, sort of doing gestures, in, in, in air gestures in order to authenticate and have shown and, and, and even captured sort of the hand, a model of the hand in order to be able to uh, characterize a specific individual and then authenticate the individual, right? Uh, one can also use the leap as a signature. One can write something, and the leap will pick that up. So one can simply sign in the air with your finger, and the leap picks that up, and one can then use that for authentication. People have shown that's possible as well, uh, with uh, some reasonable false acceptance, false acceptance rate. Uh, devices which have a motion sensor, people have shown that you can wave them in the air. You can actually hold it and, and draw patterns or draw some secrets and things of that sort, and that can be picked up very well. Uh, and those could be, again, they have uh, behavioral biometrics that they can capture. Uh, perhaps one of the funny ones there was uh, something called Headbanger, which plays, um, plays music and you nod your head in response to it, and, and the way you're nodding your head uh, essentially becomes an authenticator. So uh, academics have been doing strange, strange, funny things, uh, but a variety of techniques have, have been uh, proposed. Uh, and then finally, you also have uh, the last interface, which somehow seems to be slowly being used uh, in some situations is your brain interface, right? So of course, you're not going to put electrodes on your head and lie down and then think about something and that, that is your password. That's not uh, feasible. Uh, but nevertheless, there are these off-the-shelf headsets that have been, uh, that, are, that are sold and one can uh, put them on and they do capture some signals uh, in, in the brain and uh, the, what what is being shown is that one can use that in order to sort of just think about a secret, and that would be your password, right? You stand in the front of your, uh, whatever, you, when, you, when you're authenticating, maybe you close your eyes and for five seconds you, you think about something and that. Now, what kinds of false acceptance, false rejections you have, are kind of very dubious at this point, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's kind of possible. People are showing that there is some, uh, potentially a way to authenticate people based on that. Uh, people also looking at electrocardiogram, ECGs, and, and things of that sort in order to, uh, to authenticate uh, folks and getting a pretty reasonable sort of accuracy. Uh, another technique which is kind of interesting for head, head, uh, headsets is this so-called bone conduction. And kind of I mix things up here a bit, I realize. Uh, so essentially, if you have a headset and you want to authenticate it, uh, you just put the headset on, and the headset will emit sound from one side where there is a speaker, 
uh, but this would be not sound that you will be able to hear, right, at a frequency that human ear cannot pick it up, but that sound will make its way through your skull and get picked up by the microphone at the other end, and, and that can characterize the shape of your skull, skull to something that depends on the shape of your skull to some extent. And one can then say, yep, it is this person wearing the headset, right? So without me having to do anything, just put it on. As long as my skull has not changed much, uh, I'm, I'm authenticated, right? And skull is not something that, that changes much. So uh, kind of an interesting physiological biometric kind of base technique that uh, people have looked at. Uh, similarly, ear acoustics, right? So again, uh, in the insides of our ear are, are, are distinct. Uh, unique, again, could be a strong word. Uh, and one can sort of emit a sound, the device, uh, like a phone, for example, when you put it against your ear, capture the shape and say, yep, this is the right person. Yes, so people are showing that these kinds of techniques are also possible. Uh, how plausible they are, how practical they are, we don't know yet, but, but such te techniques are being inve investigated. So of course, I, I will say all this, and then you'll say, OK, what about fingerprints, right? So I didn't talk about them because I didn't think of it as a natural user interface. I was talking about touch interface, voice interface, camera interface, et cetera. Uh, but nevertheless, the fingerprint is, is perhaps now the most widely used, uh, one of the most widely used technique for authenticating, at least on smartphones, right? Uh, and it looks all fine, but, but there are some issues with it. Uh, recently, we did some work showing some problems with it. So if you have an iPhone and then you kind of, if you've enrolled a finger, uh, the, they, it goes through a process where you repeatedly put your finger on the sensor and, and there is a little animation which is kind of filling the thing up, saying, okay, give me more, give me more, now you have your complete fingerprint. And it kind of is giving you the impression that it's stitching your fingerprint together, right? That's not the case. That's not what it's doing. No fingerprint is being stitched together. Instead, what it's doing is it's capturing partial fingerprints. It's capturing small, 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 small windows of your fingerprints and storing them. And it, of course, it culls them in some way. It discards some as long as there's too much overlap. It keeps some, some of them, 8 to 10, for example, partial fingerprints. And it stores them and says, OK, now these partial fingerprints represent you. Now, when you try to authenticate yourself and you present a fingerprint, right? it doesn't know what, what orientation and position your finger is at. As long as it matches any of those partials, it lets you in. It doesn't have to match, right? Because the way you place it, a different partial is being captured. And as long as any partial is a match, it, maybe it has eight or 10 sitting in there, and then if any of these windows it matches, it says, OK, you're in. Not only that, it doesn't even know, the device doesn't know which finger you're presenting, right? Uh, you may, I typically have three fingers enrolled, my two thumbs and an index finger, uh, depending on how I'll be picking up the phone. And the device doesn't know which finger, so now there are 10 for each finger, so as long as whatever partial print you, you, you present matches any of the 30, you're in. Okay? Now that's a problem, because from security guy, it's not just one password, it's one of 30 if it matches you're in. Right? And suddenly, what about the distinctiveness? We know fingerprints have some amount of distinctiveness, but partial fingerprints? So my face is reasonably distinct, I hope, but if you just look at my face from a window like that, will it be distinct? Not as much. The distinctiveness comes down. So how much does it come down? Well, we, 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 we uh, uh, sort of, uh, so I don't have the slide here, sorry. We, we came up with the notion of a master print, saying, can I create a master print that will match a large number of people? And the, uh, the, the, our definition of master print was that if I, if I can create an artificial print that can match 3% of the people, then I call it a master print. Why 3%? We were basing 3% on the fact that if I give you a phone and if it's locked by a pin, What's the, what's the best thing you can do to unlock it? Turns out the best thing you can do is type in 1234, right? Because 3% of people use 1234 as their password. Okay. So we're saying that, okay, is there an analogous to 1234? Is there a fingerprint that, I, that is there that I press against it and 3% of the time unlocks? It turns out that we could create fingerprints that unlocked 35% of times, not 3%. 
any, of course, this is based on the data set. Uh, we didn't actually create the physical fingerprint. There are issues there, there are caveats. And, uh, but it turns out that experiments sh are showing that th this whole business of using small sensors to capture fingerprints uh, is, is taking a sort of, is leading to uh, lower security in the sense that you can actually now get collisions. You can find fingerprints that will unlock a phone. Right. So if you just Google the word master print, you'll probably, uh, master print and memon, you'll run into it. Let me stop here. Uh, Saraju is telling me to get out, out, get out so uh, let me take any questions you might have. Uh, hi, um, I have a question about the most recent um, face ID that mm -hmm. Apple announced with uh, the iPhone 10. Uh, have you evaluated that? Do you have any comments Not on really, its uh, no. potential security flaws? No, I, I haven't. Uh, I, I, I said earlier that your face is not a secret. Uh, and of course, there's always a cat and mouse game going on between people who spoof and people who detect spoofing. Uh, and I understand there are enough mechanisms in the device to catch spoofing in that case. Uh, but then, then they are not cheap, they're expensive, right? So uh, having something like that in every, every device uh, low-end devices are devices that, um, and we're not just talking about smartphones, right? Authen when you're authenticating in the IoT world, there are all kinds of devices that you might be working on. It may not be uh, the right sort of method for that. But I've not evaluated it, no. Uh, I have this question of master face, right? So are there faces that tend to match other faces? You would say, well, not really, because it depends. Uh, but I can say, okay, 35-year-old Indian. Can I create a master face uh, for, for that? And I've, I've asked my students to, doing it, to do it, but they, they don't listen to me. Nobody has done that yet. We so it's possible that one of them might pick that up and, and start looking at that. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think the, the Apple ID is actually a 3D profile, sure. a depth profile, rather sure. than just a sure. flat thing. But uh, r just following up on what Michael asked, uh, I just wonder, uh, uh, I'm intrigued by the, the, the face recognition or the image recognition, and I just wonder whether maybe there's, there's some enhancements, like some dynamic aspect to it that uh, could That can could, slowly could be incorporated, yeah. right. Yeah. 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 And I don't know what, what sort of ongoing research there might be in that area. Or so people look at, uh, of course, for spoofing, they're looking at uh, even be able to tell that there is blood flow, right? The fact that it's not a... Uh, zombie face or, or, or made up face and things of that sort. Uh, they're looking at movements of the eyes, they're looking at other sort of uh, muscle, uh, the way they contract, face, facial muscles and things of that sort. So there's a lot of go work going on that detects spoofing, detects artificial faces, yes. But there's not much work going on in the sense of the generating master faces, right? So the problem is, earlier on I talked about the dictionary attack. Passwords are susceptible to a dictionary attack. Our work in master print shows that biometrics also are susceptible to a dictionary attack. There are certain biometrics, there are certain instances of biometrics that tend to match more than others, right? And one can then cleverly construct these uh, dictionaries, and that work has not been done. Right? Uh yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very intriguing and innovative. Uh, speaking about the biometric mm -hmm. signatures, there is there was actually a paper presented about two years ago mm -hmm. in uh, ICCE. Mm -hmm. You have quoted a paper mm -hmm. dated in 2013 mm -hmm. uh, using the EEG mm -hmm. uh, signal, right. and the error rate was uh, recorded as 1.1%, if I recall your figure. Sure. Uh, that is extremely high to me uh, because of the uncertainty of uh, EEG measurement and all that. Do you have any insight as far as how they, uh, uh, how they can achieve 1.1% error rate with uh, EEG so, signature? So what Thank happens you. in all these academic uh, sort of, these, so these are just sort of, they, they remind the proof of concept work, right? So they have a, a controlled environment, uh, with a small number of subjects, and then they right. So, so the live environment where essentially uh, 
someone could be walking, running, and, and these things are different. And, and so they did it in a controlled environment with some activity. So it's not simply the EEG of whatever. The, they did it with some activity, so there's some disturbance in the background. But in a very controlled way, so with 20, 30 subjects. And so, but, but that's how science or research works, right? We start off with these things, and then you guys take it up and take it to the real levels. It's for us to open new ways. Like even when IRIS first came out, the, the error rate was 10%, right? Uh, and then we improved it, made it better, and uh, uh, so I, I don't know if I answered your question, but, but it, it was in a very controlled environment, in a lab-like setting. We have another question here. I just want to make a comment. The, the printed uh, program that uh, you have in front of you shows this session ending at 945. It, it actually, the, the program's been updated online. It actually ends at 10. So we have till 10 and we have time for a few more questions. Oh, okay. And Tom has got one here. So I could have talked more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask a question about the stability of biometric um, you know, identification. For instance, I've noticed uh, on one of my devices that used to do the fingerprint identification no longer works, right? I keep putting my finger on it, it doesn't happen. So about that, the other thing I was wondering is, you know, if uh, this, the ability to take more sophisticated attacks, I can 3D print somebody's face, for instance, right, and find it. Now, I know they're using infrared usually for doing right. depth identification. Could they also use that to sense whether it's a warm body or not? And of course, then you could put a Right. Something warm behind the face. But right. Anyway. Right. I just so want to there's talk a about cat and mouse game going on. Yeah. There, there are, I know someone in, uh, somewhere up north very, where it's very cold, at Plaxen, uh, where they actually are creating fingerprints, which, and they, they're, they're sort of pumping liquid through it uh, to, uh, to sort of simulate blood flow. Right. Uh, so, so now, if some random person takes my phone, would they be able to do that? No, right? But if now I'm worried about the FBI unlocking my phone, yeah, they might, they might have the resources to do that. But that's, right, so it's all the threat model as well. So you may look at, one of the problems with this is you can look at these things and say, hey, I can break it this way, break it that way, that's fine. Uh, but it depends on the threat model. What is it that you're trying to sort of counter? And, and then the cost and the usability issues with the threat model should together allow you allow you to pick uh, the right technique right so uh, uh, to be more safe to our secret do you think we need to add some uh, principal condition to the physical features for example a fingerprint or right. face right the the secret master must be alive because from a hollywood movie we can see that somebody can cut some you know dead people's finger to to make the fingerprint even the people died use the face so we can still you know unlock the secret so do you think we need to add some you know heart beating blood pressure all these things to the security system to make sure, sure the master is alive. Sure. So, so what is uh, may, may, maybe uh, I'm answering a question, but let me let me try. Uh, so, there is this notion of continuous authentication that's emerging in the academic world, right? And the idea there is that you are you have sensors on you, uh, and you have a device with you with many sensors also. Uh, the smartphone knows more about me than my wife does, right? Because it knows all the time where I am. Uh, it can potentially hear me. Uh, it knows all the co communication that I'm engaging in. And so it should know me by now. So it should be sensing all the time and say, yeah, uh, maybe 60% chance that this is Memon. Now, your application say, no, 60% not good enough, give me a better. Then it can sense, maybe open up the camera and see, or open up the microphone, see if it can hear me, and then raise that level of certainty. So you have this continuous authentication going on that allows an application to use it and decide whether, whatever, to, to, to pick the right level of certainty that is needed for that, that application for authentication. And those kinds of techniques typically use multiple sensing, right? Uh, the other uh, uh, sort of the trend in academia that's going on is, as you said, using multiple simultaneously in a dynamic way, right? So if I'm, if I'm doing one activity 
which is captured by a sensor, it affects another act, another sensor's input as well, what, what is being sensed by another input. And the, the two have to match, right? So if I'm um, um, typing or, or something of that sort, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, the, the keyboard, keyboard pattern people measure the way that, that is done. Uh, perhaps that like could be, uh, uh, and then there is a motion sensor on my watch as well, right? So those two have to match for, and one can measure both of them and say, yep, there is, there, this is a real live input as opposed to a spoofed one. So one of the ways to counter spoofing is to have uh, multiple uh, sensors sort of corroborate each other, correlate with each other, catching that, and, and therefore catching that something's spoofing. We, we'll, we have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, I'll throw in the, the trivial twins question you can get to, but you start to answer my question, which is a more nuanced view of security. Right now, you know, we have the Maginot line, Molly put a big wall around it. What, in terms of security people you speak to, how many are going to sort of degrees of trust? Like, you could be using the device casually, then your bank actually needs a transaction, right. and at that point, they ask for more in terms of protocols forward and standards, instead of just one application being careful. Right. Right, I, I think I kind of said that in my earlier thing, no, right, that said, if I'm just uh, unlocking my phone, fine, go ahead. But if I'm, I open the browser, go ahead, right, if I, if I have certain assurance that it's you. But the moment I hit my bank app, it elevates once more, 